Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 104, Ageism and the PhD. This is a liminal vlog, it's also an accidental vlog that's nested between the amazing work that the wonderful Dr Danny Milos, hi Danny, Danny did last week exploring the new professional development program that we're instigating, but it's also linked with the trilogy of vlogs that's going to follow this session today and they are on the knowledge economy, creative industries and the fourth industrial revolution. And can I say this session today was almost titled A Stroppy Professor's Guide to Ageism and the PhD because I've got something to say about this issue. So we'll call it Ageism and the PhD and if I get a bit stroppy on the way through, we might change the title, see how we go. So I'll try and explain to you how and why this session suddenly became very, very necessary. And it's actually linked with professional development for you, our students, but also our supervisors. So last week, one of your supervisors said to me, and I quote, professional development for PhD students is irrelevant because they're all going to end up in postdocs, end of quote. And a second supervisor asked why she needed to get involved in professional development at all as, quote, I don't need it, and Tara needs to explain to me why it's necessary that I do it, end of quote. So thank you to colleagues for those comments, and let me offer some answers to you. So the first answer to why a supervisor, or indeed anyone, students, supervisors, anyone, requires professional development is the same answer I give when I deliver keynotes around the world on information literacy. And that answer is clear. You do not know what you do not know. I'll say that again, you do not know what you do not know. Now obviously you know what you know, and I'm sure you're very comfortable with that and confident in that, and that's great. But that's based on experience, not expertise. How do you know what you do not know? And the answer is, of course, via professional development. You may think you're a terrific supervisor, and I'm sure you are, but that's based on experience and not expertise. And higher education is changing so radically and so quickly at the moment that how we supervise now is different from how we supervised even two years ago. And as to the statement that all PhD students end up in postdocs, I had to have a bit of a time out, Kimmy, time out in my office after I heard that statement. Because I suppose I understand why the emotions came out in response to that statement. And that's because none of my PhD students, none of them, have ended up in postdocs. They've ended up in academic posts, a lot of them certainly, but they've been in balanced academic roles, teaching and research. Many of them, of course, are ended up professors. Brilliant. But they've also ended up just as frequently running their own small and medium-sized businesses. I've got a large number of my students that are consultants and make a living out of consultancy in sport, popular music, screen cultures and regional development. Another group have headed up all sorts of organisations in disability management, in multicultural affairs and in regional development. And the diversity of those jobs is incredibly, incredibly exhilarating for me because it demonstrates what a university can be and what a PhD program can do. We can populate society with brilliant people. Now, I'm really not that unusual, and you could argue because I've supervised through such a range of disciplines, my experience is probably more normative than most. So where's this stuff coming from that everybody supposedly ends up in a postdoc? Well, firstly, we need to recognise from the hard sciences, which is seen to be you know, the most obvious place in which students enter postdocs, nature described postdocs recently as, quote, permadox. So the postdoc is bouncing from temporary job to temporary job to temporary job to temporary job through the entirety of their career. So postdocs as permadox. The economist referred to postdocs as, quote, the dark underbelly of academia, end of quote. The dark underbelly of academia, end of quote. So why are we promoting this? We need to remember that postdocs are temporary research appointments. Yes, they're important, they get you on your way, that's great. But I would much prefer that every single one of you start to move into balanced teaching and research roles. Why? 
because they're more stable and the contracts last longer. Remember, teaching subsidizes research at universities. Teaching subsidizes research. So the teaching that you do pays your bills. A Stanford study in 2016 and this just blew my head off, can I say? A Stanford study in 2016 confirmed that only 31% of biomedical graduates ended up in a postdoc. 31%. Now, remember, noting that the postdoc in and of itself is impermanent, and also remember that biomedical graduates are the youngest of the students on our campuses. They're working in labs, so they're in an immersive research environment, and frequently they're on scholarship. So, of course, they're not a generalizable sa sample in any way, shape, or form. So here we are, the group that is most likely to have a postdoc, and a 2016 study at a posh university confirmed that only 31% of them ended up there. So, Everyone does not end up in a postdoc. In fact, a minority of a very few disciplines end up in a postdoc. So what's going on here? Why have we got this narrative taking place? Firstly, I think there is the assumption that how supervisors lived our academic life is how our students will live their academic life, and that's just frankly hashtag wrong. And secondly, of course, ageism. There is an assumption that all PhD students are young men and women without family commitments, dedicated their, to their studies as their number one priority, and are prepared to go anywhere in the world for work. Now, there is a reason for that, because historically, universities were a place where rich, young, white men prepared themselves to run the family estate, or members of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, prepared their children to work in bourgeois professions. So medicine, the law, the clergy, the army, the military, and so forth. Now, that's the history of our universities. If you read Cardinal Newman's The Idea of the University, you see that narrative of young men going into middle class professions very clearly presented. So that ideology in so many ways configures what we do in universities to this day. There are assumptions about who is at a university and a lot of those assumptions are about young white men. So whenever anybody makes assumptions about a normal student, let alone a normal PhD student, I try and remind people of this particular ideology and how it's not actually linked with the reality, the sociology of what's happening in higher education right now. So let's get into that sociology, shall we? The average age of a PhD student starting at Flinders University is 36 years of age. 36 years of age. So let's have a think about 36 as a sociological profile and an age. Right, at 36, you've probably got a partner or you've had a partner and you've divorced and you want to reboot your life. Just under two thirds of women will either have a child or will shortly have a child at 36, noting that about one quarter of the women in my generation and the generations that follow won't have any children. So again, you can't generalize children and women. You also at 36 have had an experience of the workplace for a substantive period. So you've paid taxes, you have responsibilities. Yes, you might have a mortgage. So the notion that this young apprentice is coming to our universities to be moulded by the Jedi Knight supervisor is simply not real. It's ridiculous and it's offensive in equal measure. You come into a PhD program as a fully grown person. You are full and complete before you begin a PhD. And on a stack of topics, you know a lot more than your supervisor. You have lived a different life from your supervisor and those differences are terrific. Those differences are important and they matter. So let's do a bit of maths, shall we? Let's do some basic maths. You arrive into the program at 36 years of age. You take three years to complete a PhD and so you graduate at 39 years of age. So. 39-year-old with probably a partner, maybe some kids, certainly a mortgage, 
Are you going to accept a one-year postdoc in another state or in another country? No, you're not. So what's going on here? Well, we've got a series of assumptions about doctoral education and indeed assumptions about who our doctoral students are. And that's starting to cause some problems. So supervisors, that's why supervisors need professional development. So to be frank, they can grasp the political economy of what is happening in higher education right now. And some of the phrases I'm using in the next few weeks, like the knowledge economy, creative industries, the fourth industrial revolution. And you need professional development, ladies and gentlemen, because you're going to have to go into interviews and use this type of language to get a job. Maybe you're going to be getting a job in three years time that you don't even know exists right now. Remember, how do you know? what you don't know. And just a reminder, the average age is 36. Now I've supervised six students over 60 in the last 12 months, and they aren't doing lifestyle doctorates. And I love lifestyle doctorates. I'd love to be supervising some people doing lifestyle doctorates. So that's when people have actually retired. They've always wanted to re research something. So they come to a university and do a doctorate as a lifestyle doctorate. That's tremendous. But the six I'm talking about actually were doing a PhD to reboot the next stage of their professional life to do the research, to write a book, and enable a series of consultancies for themselves. So they're actually regrouping, if you like, to give themselves 10 more years in the workforce. So guys, that old life cycle of people do this work and then they retire, that's absolute nonsense. It's probably always been nonsense, but it particularly is nonsense now. And the notion that, oh right, we'll do qualifications in our early 20s and then we'll never return to a campus after the age of 24 because we'll have a life of work. Again, that is absolute nonsense as well. I remember Terry Flew, I think it was 20 years ago, argued we were moving from a system of a four-year degree to a 40-year degree. The notion that we do a four-year degree and then stop is absolute nonsense. We have to have right now lifelong learning. So the ageism in the doctoral space needs to stop right now. And we need to understand who is doing a PhD, why they're doing a PhD, and what they need to get out of it to do the next stage of their life. We have to stop this apprentice nonsense. The best supervisors, you know, recognize the diversity of the students coming into the program and the diversity of outcomes they're going to need on the way out. And the reason, therefore, that supervisors, like me, must do professional development, and the reason that you do professional development, is to prepare yourself for the diversity of employment opportunities that are going to be made available to you. Can I also say some disciplines are cooler with different age groups than others. It's interesting that both law and medicine, the PhD students tend to be older because they've obviously had a medical career or they've had a legal career and have then come to do a PhD, often a PhD by prior publication. So law and medicine are quite cool with the diversity of ages and an older cohort. So my worry is what is happening to the older PhD students outside of law and outside of medicine. And I had a, a pennies drop moment when I recorded a, a podcast at the end of last year on the rescue doctorate. And you can actually hear it in my voice in real time because I realized when I was talking through the nature of the rescue doctorate and the students that I had taken over, the overwhelming majority of my students via the rescue doctorate were over the age of 60. And you can hear the surprise in my voice uh, as in real time I suddenly worked that out. So in all the cases that I took over of the Rescue Doctorate, the supervisors had described the student as intellectually simply not able to complete a PhD. So the student was not bright enough. Now actually all of the students were incredibly bright and when I took over their supervision, they all finished <laughs> from that point between three and six months later. Now I'm not a wizard. I wish I was, I love the beard, love the hats, all going on, but I'm not a wizard. But I do respect people, and I respect the diversity of the journeys that they bring to us in a doctoral program and in universities more generally. I don't work for Ford. I've chosen not to work for Ford. I don't believe in Fordist supervision. I respect enormously the diversity of the students that come into our program, and I know the gifts that they give us through their time, 
and their expertise. And that diversity creates incredible, outstanding research. So you know what? A lot of you out there, you might end up an academic if it's what you want to do. Let's, let's make sure you can get there. But what I'd ask is if you do become an academic, don't replicate this ageism when you supervise. Very important. It is time to cr critique these norms and to critique these operating principles of doctoral education. And look, we've got to realise it's a big, fabulous, glorious world out there and all sorts of different knowledge systems from a doctoral program will nest and cluster and resonate with different communities. So we must make sure that you not only do a PhD, but we are value adding to your life and your career via this program. So I'd really like to cite a blog that I discovered when I was researching this blog this week from a wonderful woman called Helen. And she was an older PhD student and she stated, quote, in some ways I realise that my age and experience outside of academia has been an advantage. I think I'm the only one in my program who has spent time thinking, preparing and making contact with people outside of universities, keeping inside and outside academic life in addition to academic life. My younger friends are modelling themselves on the only career tract that they're hearing about, the traditional academic route. And many of my younger friends, this is so sad, many of my younger friends who have finished up have been devastated to find that this one option has been closed off to them or always deferred or always around the corner and they don't know what to do, end of quote. Isn't that desperately sad? So Helen's done something amazing there. She's kept the contacts going that she did before she entered the program and has got a real sense of the diversity of jobs that are available to her, whereas her younger friends in the program have simply gone, oh, look, I want to be an academic, and that opportunity has not presented itself to them. So we have to learn, I think, from the experience, the behaviour of great students like Helen. We need to learn from these students and recognise the gift that they are giving us. Now, remember, this is me speaking, okay, and I've lived a very traditional academic life. I finished my school as ducks. I went straight to university. I finished first class honours when I was 21. I finished a research master's with distinction when I was 23. And I finished my PhD without correction by 25. I did some contract academic jobs. I had tenure by 27. I was a professor by 36. I then did head of department, head of school roles, and I was dean by 46. So that's a very traditional academic life. I've lived that narrative, that's been my experience. And you know what? That experience has only intensified my respect for people who are doing this journey differently. I don't, I don't validate or romanticize academic life really in any way. It is a really hard life and there's a lot of weird people in universities and a lot of weird stuff happens here that we sort of take for granted. And I think one of the reasons that the older PhD students are having problems with their supervisors and require rescue supervision is because they call out the weird stuff. So, you know, students go, well, why are we doing this? And, I, and I'm sorry, you can't speak to me like that. So I think that's where some of the problems are occurring. So they're calling out the behaviour. And you know what? Good on them. You keep doing that and you will improve how we behave and supervise at universities because you're keeping us honest. You remind us of the bigger, beautiful, astoundingly diverse world that exists outside of our universities. So instead of ageism in academia, we need to learn from the diverse experiences of our PhD students, understand their journey, but also understand what they can teach us. So if anyone says these days, I don't need any professional development, I sort of step away from the vehicle a little bit. You know, in the old days I used to just laugh, like, I don't need professional development. I just laugh, oh, well, yeah, isn't that great? At a university you don't like learning, oh, bless. These days I get a little bit more concerned about it because I think I don't need professional development. That phrase is actually a code for something else. That's code for I am fantastic. 
I have nothing to learn and I am a legend. Bless. But to quote Monty Python's Life of Brian, or indeed to quote Brian's mother from the Life of Brian, quote, he's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy, end of quote. Supervisors, trust me, we are not the Messiah. We are very naughty boys and girls, but we are also flesh and blood and bone, and we make a lot of mistakes. Yes, we are clever, but the cleverest among us recognize how much there is left to learn. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.